it almost keeps you from going out and trying for bigger and better things because of that fear. Sometimes it does. Yeah. And, and sometimes the fear, like you say, isn't about, can I work or can I get off uh, of, of disability benefits? It's about, well, what if the job doesn't work out? Like what if, yeah. what if I get laid off because of corporate downsizing or what if the job is inaccessible? And so I feel that it's really important for us to understand how our finances work so that we can make really good decisions about whether we go to work or not, or if we do go to work, um, you know, how that looks for us. A cartoon of a man sitting at a computer typing on a keyboard. The view zooms out and we see dozens of other identical men working in office cubicles. The screen goes black. The words working blind appear in green, typed out as if on an older style computer. Hey guys, it's Sam with The Blind Life. Welcome back to the channel where I help you learn how to live your best blind life. Once again, we are continuing our Working Blind series where we talk to amazing VIPs in the community who are working. Find out what they do in hopes that we can inspire you guys and just let you know what's possible. So today we have an amazing guy named Chris. I'll let him introduce himself and tell you more about himself, but uh, I'm really excited about this conversation. So Chris, let's get into it. Thank you very much for, for chatting with me today. Hey, Sam. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So why don't you officially introduce yourself and tell... Talk to me a little bit of first about your vision impairment. So my name is Chris Peterson. I am uh, totally blind due to something called Leber's congenital amaurosis. Me and my sister were both born with it. So I was always with at least one other blind person growing up. And now I have two jobs. I am a software developer and also a financial educator. Yeah. And so before we get to that, though, um, I want to know about your sister. So um, how was that? So I had a sister growing up, too, who was visually impaired. And I've always said that I think in some ways, a lot of ways, actually, it made it easier and made it easier to deal with because I had somebody there who could relate and who was going through all the same things that I was. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it probably did. I, I think it's really important for blind people to know other blind people. Mm -hmm. And it, if you have a sibling or or a relative or or a f close friend or whatever it might be that you're with all the time, it, it at least gives you somebody to bounce things off of. Um, you know, sometimes because my sister and I were very close in age, sometimes we were uh, we got along really well, and other times we fought like cats and dogs, but, um, you know, we definitely could relate to each other as far as our vision was concerned. And I know that not every blind person has that growing up. Did you guys, were you born totally blind or diagnosed at a certain age and then progressed to total vision loss? So we were born with not very much vision. Mm -hmm. Okay. What uh, what I think I remember is is uh, my visual acuity when I was in oh about first or second grade was two two hundred. So you know twenty twenty means that for something twenty feet away that someone with normal vision could see they they should be able to see it and 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 read it twenty feet away. Twenty two hundred means that uh, for something that a person with normal vision should be able to see. 200 feet away um you know a person can see can see it uh, 20 feet away and and read it and um for me uh the thing that a normal person would be able to see 200 feet away i would be able to see it at, at two feet in front of my face mm -hmm. so not very much vision at all i lost most of my vision when i was in my 30s it was a real gradual process so i can't tell you exactly when it started or how long it took. And my sister now has some more vision than I do because of that. Okay. And she lords it over you every time you. Oh, yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, so safe to say you've, you've been working blind your entire working life, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about that. So, um, you have the two jobs and, um, the second one is your own company, right? It is my own company. It's a nonprofit organization I founded in 2020, um, right at the start of the pandemic. 
Um, we're building financial literacy education programs for blind people because it, we know that it's difficult to work as a blind person, but some people are also uh, choosing not to or are worried about working because they're worried about how it's going to affect their finances. And uh, while I firmly believe that working and earning a regular paycheck is a way better deal for us than collecting social security benefits, um, there are reasons why people might want to to be able to do both um, or to be able to switch back and forth at different points in their lives. And, and so I feel that it's really important for us to understand how our finances work so that we can make really good decisions about whether we go to work or not, or if we do go to work, um, you know, how that looks for us. Yeah. And that you bring up a good, very good point. I've heard it so many times before people talking about being on disability and there's that fear that, and, and as you said, some will kind of scale back their work just so they don't go over that threshold, that monthly threshold that they're supposed to, they're required or they're allowed to make because they're scared to lose it. Um, I think because partly it's such a complicated process to get on or if you lose it to get back onto it and they're worried or they're worried that, well, maybe they don't have a steady income and in the future, if it's not steady or if they lose that, then they're, they're not going to have that disability to fall back on. It almost keeps you from going out and trying for bigger and better things because of that fear. Sometimes it does. Yeah. And, and sometimes the fear, like you say, isn't about, can I work or can I get off uh, of, of disability benefits? It's about, well, what if the job doesn't work out? Like what if, yeah. what if I get laid off because of corporate downsizing or what if the job is inaccessible? So there's a lot of different fears that play into it. And, and um, when I started working, um, I had some of those fears too. Um, but I also really didn't know what I didn't know. And um, I kind of just jumped in with both feet. And I am really glad I did because I feel like I've done way better uh, from working than I would have had I chosen not to, mm -hmm. but I definitely think that if, if I had the choice to make now as a more mature adult, I could, I can definitely relate to the fear that uh, people have around that. So prior to, uh, your current, um, the nonprofit, it's called Penny Forward, which I love because, uh, you are a guide dog user, uh, but the guide dog is not named Penny, right? <laughs> That's not the name That's of your true. dog. <laughs> no, his name is Javier. Um, but the name was inspired by uh, uh, the forward command that you give to a guide dog when you want to go somewhere. And uh, uh, Penny seemed like it could be a guide dog name and also, mm -hmm. you know, kind of relates to, to money. So that was uh, how, how I came up with the name. Yeah, it fits perfectly <laughs> on so many different levels. Yeah. Um, so you said 2020, I believe, is what you said. You started the, the nonprofit. Yeah, it was 2020, right before the pandemic, and I had been running it for about three months as a blog at the time. And when the pandemic hit, like a lot of people, I got distracted and stepped away from it for around nine months and then decided that really I wasn't doing much of anything else. And because of all of the free time that we had uh, all of us being locked down and staying at home, you know, it wasn't there was no better time to be starting a nonprofit. So in 2021, I started pushing at it harder. Um, I started up a podcast. I started to talk to people online about what they would want from a financial education organization that was helping the blind community. And I started recruiting board members and we officially incorporated as a nonprofit organization in, in September of 2021. So we are just a little over a year old now. Oh, that's great. Well, congratulations. Yeah, I my my wife does all the finances for for my YouTube and all of that. And she's fantastic at it, way better than I am. 
math was never my strong suit <laughs> in school. Um, and she is actually the one that introduced me to you because you guys kind of running in the same online circles. Yeah, yeah. Rachel and I ran into each other uh, in a personal finance Facebook group. And um, we actually uh, met up because she posted a question about, uh, well, how how can I work on my fan finances with my blind husband? So I <laughs> threw out an answer and said, hey, I'm a blind per person and kind of hit it off. So it was pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. I think you guys were... Um kind of bonded over the frustrations of this one particular app. We won't name any names, but <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. So your other work um, in software, how long have you been doing that? It'll be 20 years in January. Wow. I started my first real job in 2003 uh, working for IBM. And then I was sold along with the division of IBM I worked for to Lenovo and worked there for about five years and ended up at a company called Thrivent Financial that is a financial services company. And I've been doing that for the past three years in addition to my financial education work. Okay. I'm just curious, what, what kind of um, software work did you do with IBM and Lenovo? At the time that I was there, I did a bunch of different things. I started out working on some uh, uh, administration software for uh, some Windows servers hmm. um, that were attached to uh, sort of a mini computer called the AS400 at the time. Um, and then I was moved into a different role where I worked on mainframe software, uh, mainframe computers that were you know, first developed back in the 60s. Um, and some of the software that I was enhancing had started its life before I was born. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I I moved back into server administration in kind of a different way and uh, ended up, when I moved to Lenovo, I ended up doing uh, writing server administration software for for managing multiple servers uh, over a web interface. Hmm. Okay. So so maybe not the most glamorous work. <laughs> no. Dealing with servers important though. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when you're a geek, it's fun. Oh so, yeah. So you know, there's there's that too. That's awesome. Um. Well, this was a question that I recently got um, on one of my other videos. Someone was interested to learn about where you're doing the work. So are, all of this work, is it from home? Do you do it in an office? If you do work in an office, um, what's the transportation like? I started out in an office when I first started working and I found an apartment near my office. So I had a single bus ride to and from work every day. Uh, and the bus ride was about five minutes long. And uh, that's how I, I worked for about 10 years. Um, they did let us work from home. So uh, occasionally I would decide that I wanted to work from home on a particularly snowy day, or if I was just, <laughs> you know, right. not, not feeling so good or, or whatever. But for the most part, um, we were expected to be in the office and I had some bosses that even said, you know, I, I prefer that you be in the office rather than, than working from home. I really want to see you here. And uh, so I had to kind of read, read that depending on my bosses in 2010, my father-in-law was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and I got permission to work from home full time because of that, because uh, my wife wanted to to move to be closer to her family and I didn't have an office I could access. So since 2010, I've been primarily working from home, although I did go back into the office when I joined Thrivent for a while. And, and then because of the pandemic, that's now reverted back to working from home. And there's goods and bads to both of that. Um, working from home is really nice and really convenient. Um, transportation as a blind person can be kind of dodgy, especially in bad weather situations or, or other situations. Um, but uh, it, it also can be very fulfilling to be in an office with other people and being able to interact with them every day. So um, I, I like it both ways. And I, I like being able to have the flexibility. 
Yeah, it seems to be the um, kind of the theme these days, post pandemic, um, a mm -hmm. lot more employers are flexible on that type of thing. Um, Rachel's working from home today, in fact. <laughs> and uh, I did too. I So I, yeah, I agree with you. There's, there's an energy in, in an office. And when you work from home or you go from working in office to working from home, um, you kind of miss that. You kind of miss the, you know, standing around the water cooler, chatting with your coworkers and that sort of thing. Yeah. So accommodations with, with your, your, with penny forward and your software work, what kind of accommodations do you require in order to do the job, whether that's like hardware, software, uh, more time, transportation, anything like that? Um, <clears throat> so some kind of, uh, uh, wishy-washy accommodations, meaning that I don't need them all the time. And there, these are, are, are not necessarily accommodations that, that are disability specific are things like being able to work from home, uh, mm -hmm. flexibly, um, that that's really helpful because if there's a bad snowstorm, I live in Minnesota where we have those. Um, it can be very hard to get around until that's cleared up and uh, being able to work from home rather than getting lost in the snow is a great accommodation. Um, my bosses have, have always been very good about being willing to accommodate flexing my hours around when buses um, are available. So, you know, if I if I couldn't get in at exactly 730 because the bus got there at 735, uh, that was okay as long as I could, you know, stick around until uh, you know, four, four thirty-five and then leave after that, for for example. And then there are the more concrete disability specific accommodations. Uh, I use JAWS uh screen reading software and I also used a braille display for software development and and I still use those things uh although uh NVDA has come a long way as a screen reader and I find myself using it most of the time now um not only because it's free but but in some ways it is actually better than jaws um being that it was written by blind software developers it has a lot of really nice features for blind software developers, which is cool. Um, as, as far as Braille is concerned, um, coding does require a, a pretty good knowledge of, of how your code is formatted. Um, it makes it easier for sighted people to read if your code is indented in certain places and, and kind of looks nice. So, it was very valuable to me to be able to read my code in Braille and also to be, to be able to feel how it was formatted to make sure that I had it formatted correctly in, in Braille. Those are really the, the major accommodations. Um, going back to the minor ones, though, um, occasionally in a meeting or something, if there's a, a PowerPoint slide that's uh, on the screen and, and somebody says, you know, I'm not going to read this because I know you can all see it. I may have to speak <laughs> up and advocate for myself and say, you know, I, I need I need to know what what you expect me to get out of this. I, I don't need you to read me the slide necessarily, but I need to know the message that that everybody else is is taken away from this. Um I, I really think that self-advocacy is uh, is a really important skill. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I imagine, have you been a Braille reader your whole life? Yeah. Yep. I thought that figured that. So what's your favorite Braille display? Just, just curiosity. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I don't have a strong favorite only because I don't really pay attention to all of the innovations in in braille display dumb um i had a braille star 80 from handy tech uh mm. that i got when i started working in 2003 and i still have it and wow. it still works wonderfully so um so <laughs> the pins in, the pins still come up and everything they, they do they wow. do and in, in that sense um it's it's my favorite braille display but um <laughs> You know, I've I've occasionally gotten my hands on Braille displays that uh, friends have have had, um, and I'm really interested in uh, things like the um, the Mantis displays from uh, from Humanware um, or from APH and Humanware, I guess. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, I don't, I haven't actually any, you know, I haven't actually dropped any coin on any of those, but uh, um, someday I may. Yeah. It just, it could be a business expense. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, so that's pretty cool. I'm glad you, you mentioned JAWS and NVDA. Um, it's nice because NVDA is free. It's nice that you can have that option also, uh, to explore either or, cause you know, I found that with, with vocational rehabilitation, they always, um, suggest JAWS or they all, that's what they'll purchase for the, the client, the consumer. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm glad that that NVDA is an option that's accessible for people to just throw on there and try it out. I have a friend, a very good friend who uh, went to school for computer programming. He's, he's totally blind as well. And he is a diehard NVDA fan. He <laughs> almost a little bit fan fanboyish. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> so it must be, yeah, it must be good. He must enjoy it for the programming as well. Yeah, I I have a lot of good things to say about it, and and uh, it doesn't cost anything, which is wonderful. And yeah. it's developed by a nonprofit, so I hope that people support them. Um, but Jaws served me well for twenty years of of software development and quite a few years of of other work and school before that. And you know, I started using Jaws for DOS back in the nineteen nineties. Mm. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm very very grateful. For its existence and uh every once in a while i do need to switch back to it because it does something that nvda won't do yeah you're right it really paved the way for for a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. so that's awesome so um how about your your previous jobs at, at ibm and lenovo were they pretty uh willing to get you whatever accommodations you needed yes uh ibm was really really good uh in fact a blind employee at IBM connected with me fairly quickly after I started and walked me through the accommodations process and how to use it and and gave me some ideas of of what I could request and why I might want to request it because I wasn't sure you know I didn't want to overstep mm -hmm. uh, when I was just getting there um, because I had most of those accommodations in place when I moved to Lenovo they stayed in place. So, um, but Lenovo was very proactive at making sure that they stayed in place, which was, which was also really great. Um, and then, uh, you know, I kind of had to start all over at, at Thrivent when I got there, uh, with getting all that stuff set up again, um, which is, you know, a, a disadvantage, I think, to, um, your employer purchasing your accommodations for you. Um, if you can take them with you. Uh, to me, then then that is a, a a selling point that, hey, you know, I can bring my accommodations with me to a job and, and my employer doesn't have to figure that stuff out for me. Right. But some employers want to. They don't want you to bring in your own Braille display and, you know, and hook it up to their computers. It might be a security risk or something. Mm -hmm. And so they... And, um, so they want to make sure that they own all of that equipment. And, and I guess, uh, you know, having that flexibility to, to do it either way is, is probably pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great that you had a, a, a coworker help you out with the process and kind of tell you what, what to expect, because yeah, like you said, a lot of people don't know what's right. They get into somewhere new. They don't know what they're, they should be allowed. They don't want to ask for too much. They, you know, they don't want to ruffle any feathers or rock the boat when they're, you know, brand new. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, not every workplace is going to have another blind person or another person with a disability there to to help you out. It's nice when they do. It yeah. really smoothed things over very well for me when I started at IBM. And uh, I've had the chance to smooth things over for other blind people since then at, uh, you know, several of my, my jobs. So it's very helpful, but uh, you know, in, in many ways, no matter what we do, how, however mundane it might be we're blazing new trail all the time well and that brings us to uh the the final question of i think i know the answer for your current job at penny forward but in your previous in, uh, jobs how accepting were your coworkers and colleagues of your vision loss Did any any negative interactions N not very many um occasionally there were 
uh, interactions that I sort of pinned down to curiosity. Um, Mm -hmm. There were people that had never worked with a blind person before and wanted to know what they could do in order to, to make that relationship productive. Uh, I never have run across somebody that just says, said, I won't work with a blind person. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, I've I've worked in, you know, outside of the United States and in other countries and even in other countries, um, there was no more than curiosity and, and uh, willingness to learn. So um, it, it was all very, very good. And at Penny Forward, uh, because we are an organization being built by blind people for blind people, of course, we're going to be inclusive. It's probably our number one core value. Mm hmm. Well, I think that's great. Um, on that note, I will have all the contact information for Chris and Penny Forward in the video description below. Definitely reach out if financial uh, stuff is is not your forte, like like for me. <laughs> but you know it's important, and you you think you really need to address it. Definitely reach out. Uh, send them an email. Give Chris a call, um, and I'm sure they will be able to help. Thanks, Sam, for having me. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, If you guys would like to see more videos in this series, check out the video description down below for the playlist. But lots of great information all month of December. And while you're down there, also, if you have any comments, questions, leave those for me. I'll do my best to help out. If you liked the video, be sure to hit the like button. That helps out my channel. And that's it. So Sam and Chris signing off. Thank you, guys. We will see you next time. (laughs) 